Welcome! It's Thursday again. Welcome to the Bernina Basement Sewing Hub. I'm Adrienne Gallagher. I am an educator with Bernina Canada and welcome to Bernina Canada Live. I'm just going to wait a moment while everybody joins us. Today we're talking about the secret lives of some of our Bernina feet. Um, our Bernina feet are often designed for a specific purpose and then, well, Consumers, educators, we get at them and we try to design other things we can do with those very same feet. So I'm just going to check in my feet and make sure everybody is joining in and then we'll get started with the three special feet that I've selected to talk about today. All right, let's see. Let's see if I'm on my own computer. I'm here. Great. We've got about 14, 15 people, so we're getting started. That's great. Um, some people were trying to decide um, what feet I might show, and I have to say that, Lori, you're very smart. I'm definitely going to talk about number 55, the leather roller foot, so thanks for bringing that up. All right. If you're here, feel free to say hi. There's Kathy. Kathy, how are you doing in Calgary? You gonna watch my sewing room live tonight? I'm definitely gonna be there. I saw you yesterday, that's great. And I've got Fran from Whitby and Paul is here and Jane. Oh, hey Jane from Edmonton, how you doing? All right, so the secret life of Bernina Feet. We talked about um, a month ago about how terrific I think Bernina Feet are, how to fit them to your machine, um, what the different lettering systems mean. So if you need more information on that, do go back and check the Facebook Live video on that, or we have it saved to YouTube. And feel free to share it with your friends. Um, if you have questions today, pipe up, put a little question in. I'd be happy to answer it. If I miss it during the live presentation, I'll certainly uh, check in after and make sure you get the answer to your question. Um, what else is happening in Bernina? Oh, the reason I'm talking to you about secret feet today, or the secret lives of the secret lives of Bernina feet, is that there's a sale going on right now, and I don't want you to miss. I think the sale is buy two get one presser foot free. Um, I've had a bunch of Bernina people emailing me what would be the best feet, and so I'm going to give you some ideas today of a couple you might not have considered, or that you might already have, and you're not using them the way I use them. Great. All right, we're going to get started. Kathy's here. Ellen is here. Lauren. Loretta, excuse me. Oh, there's my friend Terry from the U.S. And Linda and Judy. Oh, and Dia. Great. I'm glad everybody's here. So I'm going to show you some amazing feet. All right. We're going to start first with the Bernina lap seam feet, number 70 and 71. Cool. So these are the lap seam feet. Um, they come in two sizes. 71 is an 8 millimeter and 70 is a 4 millimeter. I just think of them as big and small. And uh, you'll notice they kind of have a, a bar on the side to support the fabric. And then there's a channel to allow for the seam to pass. And you may be familiar already with lap seams. You might be wearing some jeans today. And um, here's a, a pant that I, a jean pant that I've taken apart so that you can see the, the lap seam right here. And lap seams are known to be incredibly strong, very comfortable, hard wearing, and lovely and, and flat. We call them a flat seam for heaven's sake. So um, if you look at it on the inside, you can see that all the raw edges are encased inside the seam and everything is flat here. And so, you know, children find these comfortable to wear. If you're um, working outside or in construction or in the garden um, and moving a lot, this is very hard wearing, lasts for years and years, easy to launder. It's a great seam. It's on most pants that you find around. Hey everyone, glad you're here. Hey Janice. All right, so I'm gonna just look at the larger one today. This one would make a very small seam. It would make just a four millimeter seam. So this might be used on finer fabrics, lingerie or blouses, um, shoulder seams in a blouse. This would be great to use that on that because that's where the weight of the fabric is held at the shoulder. So um, this is what it's traditionally used for is to make 
a lap scene. So I was um, inspired recently by some research on a Korean art form called Bojagi or Bojagi. You can pronounce it either way. It's Korean and it's the art of wrapping cloths. Some of these wrapping cloths are made um, in large pieces and some of them are put together in patchwork. And obviously the patchwork one is the one that's going to appeal to me the most. And I was inspired by some lectures. If you want to learn more about um, Bojagi, you can learn uh, anything by Young Min Lee would be great to research. I have a video of hers. If anybody wants to borrow it, let me know. You can borrow my video. Um, and then I was recently inspired by a local artist uh, named Elizabeth from Apita Designs in Cambridge. And I bought her pattern at Dancing Stitches in Cambridge. And she made these wonderful uh, gradient panels, these hanging panels. Um, this is a very common use of Bojagi is to use it as a decoration or a wall divider or a window covering. And what's great about this is she's used batiks, which is not a traditional fabric for this. And you can see through both sides the way she's got them hung. And the front is as beautiful as the back because there really kind of isn't a back for batik fabric. So that's what I, that was the pattern that inspired me. Um, and I'll just show you the effect that you get when you, um, when you use her pattern. You can maybe see in the light there that um, where the seams are, are very, very dark and it allows the light to go through the fabric and it looks amazing. I've got my panel just about a third of the way done already. And then if you look at the back, you'll see that the back is just as neatly finished as the front. And I prefer the side with the seam to be the front, the big lapped seam, because I think the construction is just beautiful. So that's what I want to see. So I'm gonna show you how I made this. Um, and hopefully you'll be inspired to try some bojagi of your own. All right, we're gonna go back to the machine. And we're using the number 71 foot. And what you do is you just take your two pieces of fabric and you're gonna put them together, uh, right sides out this time. And just uh, leave one fabric sticking out a quarter inch beyond the other fabric. And then I'm gonna sew a quarter inch in from this second fabric. So basically I have one seam allowance of a quarter inch and one seam allowance of a half inch. And this is very similar how to you would do this with um, a pant. You would do it the same way. Great. Um, so then you just sew about a quarter inch away. I'm using the inside of the foot um, as a measuring device to the edge of the needle. I'm just doing a straight stitch and I move my needle all the way to the left, which was five positions over. And I'm just going to do a regular old straight stitch. So see how they're overlapping and then you would just take this to the iron and press it all to the seam to the short seam so I pressed it all to the orange in this case and then press that extra seam allowance over the orange does that make sense has anybody tried Pajagi? it's really cool that's awesome I don't think anybody's tried it so we've got that that folded over now. And we're gonna do the same thing again. We're gonna sew using the, the edge of the foot as a guide. So now watch, this is the magic that happens. My ironing wasn't so good, huh, Sarah? All right, so do a couple of stitches. Just do a couple of stitches. And then what I do is I lift up my presser foot and feed the fabric in the foot. Can you see how it's set up now? So the fabric, the folded fabric, it's all pressed and folded. It's all going over and into the foot and the needle is gonna just catch it there. I'm using this already uh, sewn seam. I'm just running it on the inside toe of the foot and that's keeping it very straight and narrow. Cool.
I'm glad you're all with us. We're learning about the lap seam foot and the lap seam and how we can use it for the Korean art of Bojagi. So I'm just going to sew along and the machine's going to do all the work for me. That is it. Done. Amazing. Look how great this seam looks. I didn't have to work at all. And then when you press it, it just looks, it's finished on both sides. Let me show you the back. See the back looks just as good as the front. It's got one little seam here for the second time we sewed and the original seam there. And then on the front, you've got this nice thick seam that when I hold it up into the light, it's gonna look dark and the, the light is gonna show through the other, the other two fabrics. Isn't that cool? Sonia from Harrisburg. Wow, nice to meet you, Sonia. So that's how you do it, and you just continue on and on and on until you've made your um, your panel or your wrapping cloth, whatever you like. Um, I was experimenting over lunch because I was thinking, you know, it doesn't look very handmade. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this modern look of Pajagi, but traditionally it's handmade. And I and you kind of see the whip stitch. They they use a whip stitch to do this. So I experimented with using a tiny zigzag because there is a little bit of an opening here. You could do a tiny zigzag. I did a zigzag of 1.4 wide and 1.4 long. And look at this great technique I got. It looks more homey to me. I think it looks, and I used a contrasting thread to really make it show up. I'll show you on the back what it looks like. You just get one zigzag seam. Doesn't that look cool? I think. I, now I wish I did my whole panel this way. I started it with straight stitch. I got to finish it with straight stitch. I get out to buy another another pattern from Elizabeth and, and try another method and see what, what she thinks. And if you're really good at this, you could even get the stitch to kind of fall off the edge. Can you see that, Sarah? And doesn't that look like it was hand stitched down? But it took me just a few seconds because I did it on my sewing machine. If you love it, you gotta say like so that I know you love it, okay? So that's the number 71 foot. Um, we can interpret that fashion lap seam into home deck like in Pajagi, or there's even a method to use the same foot to bind a quilt. Let me show you how to do that. I'm making a real mess today. So what I've done is I've applied some uh, binding I sewed it on the one side, just uh, with a quarter inch like you normally do. This is two and a quarter inch binding. And you can find the instructions for this in an ebook called Just Sew It, Binding Techniques. And that's a free ebook. I will link it to our Pinterest page and I'll post it in the instructions here so that you can be sure. Hey, Kathy. Hey, Judy. Nice to see you. Um, so now I've got my binding ready and I put that on with my quarter inch foot like as, a, as normal. And now I switch to my number 71 foot. And you can do the exact same thing we did with the flat pelt seam and take advantage of the structure of this foot to make binding really easy. So all you do is fold your binding over like you, you would um, using whatever method you would do before. I'm not, let me preface this. I'm not the biggest fan of machine sewn down binding. I'm not worried about the quilt police, but I really do love a hand sewn binding. Let's get that out of the way. But every now and then, I don't know if you ever have this problem that you're a little bit behind on your deadline for a quilt to be done and you've got to get it done in an hour. So I recommend this method if you get stuck and you need to do a machine binding real quick. And you do just the exact same thing. You just do a couple of stitches to secure your binding. Lift your presser foot and feed the fabric over the lap seam foot. Okay, friend, help me out here. There we go. And now that wall of the foot holds the binding against the quilt and the needle is gonna secure it right down um, along the edge of the fold. This is just your regular French fold, double fold binding. Let's see what it looks like when I sew. So easy. So you get the idea. 
You can um, do corners with this technique. You can um, just do sewing like you normally do. Oops, I'm going off course because I'm sitting to the side. Sorry. Hang on. Oh, I missed it now. That's all right. So I'll show you the one I did earlier. Hang on. Oh, you guys make me nervous. So this is the one I did earlier, the exact same way. And you just pivot at the corner, fold it in, and turn and continue sewing on. So it's a really quick way to get a binding on. Check out the details in that ebook called Just Sew It Binding Techniques. It shows, I think, four other methods of binding using all kinds of different Bernina feet. So that's the lap seam foot. Does anybody have the lap seam foot at home already? I wonder. Anyway, I'll show you my uh, finished bajagi quilt when I get it done this weekend. So that was the first foot I wanted to talk about. The next foot I wanted to talk about was the, a series of feet. It's the 59 and 60 feet. You can see those right there. And what you'll notice that's special about them is they have these grooves on the bottom. And these can accommodate one or two cords at a time. You could, I use these to make piping. Um, they originally were basically made to do that, to make piping or cording. We do have a piping foot, but the cord that you could fit in here is really small on that piping foot. So I prefer this for adding my piping to pillows and so on. Let me show you how you would make piping. Which one am I going to use? Oh. How do you decide which foot you're going to use? Well, it's based on the size of your cording. So an inch, I think that's going to fit much better in the larger one, in 60. I think that's going to fit better. Um, these feet come in um, both a 59C and 60C, or they come in the plain foot as well. There's not much difference because the opening is exactly the same. They're both... Um, oops. My fingers. They're both nine millimeter openings. So not much different. Uh, ask if you're interested in this foot, just ask your Bernina dealer. They'll get you the right foot. So we're going to go with 60C today. And you can just cover over cording. There we go. I just got a batik fabric here and I'm just going to make a cute little cord. You can get this cord at any sewing store. Um, I got this one at the hardware store. Because that's where everybody shops for sewing supplies, right? Not so much. All right, I think I'm gonna put it here under this first. Let's see, it's under the first, the right hand uh, opening. And I'm just gonna move my needle over to the center and I just sew down and make cord. That's how hard it is. It's pretty challenging. You just wiggle the cord over there. That's pretty close to the cord. I don't know. And you've made pretty piping to go into any project. You can put it into a, a pillow, um, garmentry, um, boy, anywhere you want to put um, home deck uh, piping. So you could put it on the edge of a comforter. It looked great in the edge of a quilt to finish it off. That would be interesting. And then if you're ready to add this into a pillow, I forgot my fabric for that. Oh no, it's right here. I can use this. So imagine this is my pillow, my pillow front, my pillow back. Just make a sandwich. All the raw edges are together. And you could pin that or clip it. You know I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna pin it. And now, if I sew on the exact same line, my stitching might show. So what I do is move my needle over a bit, and now for sure I will not see my original stitching. 
let's see how my pillow looks. Oh, with a big reveal. Ah! Oh, that piping looks amazing! That looks fantastic! Yep, I love it too, Jill. I think it looks great. So, I think this is a much better foot for piping than, say, the uh, 38, the piping foot. I can, I can get a much bigger cord in there. I like a really well-defined piping, you know, cording in my project. So I tend to go for number 60 or number 59. Um, the other thing that you can do with these feet is you can make um, craft bowls with it. Let me show you some of these. So here's a bowl. Maybe Sarah can see it. Can you see that there? I can show you the edge here too. So it's just using this nice cotton covered polyester cord you can get at your local sewing store or the hardware store. I would get the one at the sewing store. They're the same price and the one at the sewing store is nicer. And I just used a zigzag to hold it together and I changed my thread to red here and you can get some different effects. And we have a ebook on this as well. Um, they do it a little differently in the ebook. Um, it's called Crafting Fun, and I'll link that as well, but I'll give you a little taste of how this is done as well. Um, all right. Oops, I dropped it. So this is a cord that couldn't go to manufacture because it had some defects in it, and a friend was nice enough to share some with me. See, it's got some defects. It just couldn't be used for its original purpose. So we repurposed it um, in piping and crafts. And what you can do is you can make the rope bowl by just using the naked cord all by itself. That would be no problem. Or you can cover the cord, use up your scraps, and um, make a really cool colored bowl or trivet or placemat in this method. It's the same method. You use the cording foot and just use a zigzag I'm just going to change the zigzag to about four and a half wide is good. Yeah, four and a half and about two or three long, something like that. And then I'm going to slip this underneath here. And you just want to... So the cord that's already been connected is on the left. The cord that I want to connect is on the right. And I just wrap the cord with some scrap fabric. I'm using three quarter inch strips. Just cut across the width of the fabric, not bias. If you don't like this shaggy fraying look, you can cut them on the bias. And you just do your zigzag stitch. And I'm rotating the piece as I go, covering over. Normally I make these scraps really, really long and I wrap them around a very expensive tool uh, commonly known as the interior of a toilet paper roll. Um, I find that's a really good way to secure your scraps. And you just wrap a little bit and sew a little bit. And wrap a little bit and sew a little bit. And away you go. And you just keep going and going and going until you make the size that you want. If you want this to become a bowl, all you have to do is tilt this up as you wrap and roll and sew. Pretty easy and you can shape that however you want. That's exactly how I shaped um, this rope bowl. I just tilted it on its side and that's what gave it this nice shape. Now I don't know about you, but during uh, this COVID lockdown, I've been doing a lot of sewing and this rope bowl got me inspired that perhaps I could make some of those like French sourdough proofing bowls. Now this bowl is a bit too small for the bread that I make, but I'm gonna try to remake it and uh, check back next week. See how the bread and the bowl went. I have a double duty update. That'll be fun. Um, so of course, there we go. You would select the foot based on um, the size of the cording. I have gone up as far as 3 8 cording. This is some 3 8 cord from the hardware store. It's all polyester. It's very hard wearing. It's just an all-purpose rope. And I 
thought that this would make an amazing rug. Look how far I've gotten so far. I worked for about 35 minutes today. I got this far. And the hardest part, to be honest, is the center. And um, some people do the center by sewing a zigzag across about four coils of this, one way and the other. That kind of secures everything together and then you can zigzag around. So I hope that helps you if you give this technique a try. I'm really looking forward to my rug. I think I might make another one for my Bernina office. It's just so easy to make and it looks so great. Even Sarah thinks she might want one. She's not sure yet. We'll work on that. So that's the cording, the double cording feet number uh, 59 and number 60. If you're interested in those, we can fit those on just about any machine. Um, I think the vintage machines like Nancy, like your old machine, we can't get it on those, but all the regular machines. So check that out. All right. And don't forget, there's a coupon on right now, the buy two, get one presser foot free, as, long, as well as many great deals on sewing machines. If your sewing machine is not doing so well and you're considering a sewing machine, there's some nice deals on right now. All right, so we covered two feet. I saved the best foot for last. Lori's favorite foot, the number 55 roller foot. Da, 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 da. Yes, it does look like a circus wheel. Absolutely. It is one of the craziest looking feet we've got. But man, oh man, this guy gets me out of some scrapes all the time. So you'll notice this consists of a wheel on the post. And let me put it on the machine and I want to sh so show you how it engages with the feed dogs. I shouldn't have had that coffee, Sarah. I can't do anything. There we go. Okay, so when I put this presser foot down, you're going to see that it's going to touch one, of my, one set of my feed dogs right there. So this is going to pull the fabric through as I sew. I'm going to sew a little bit and you'll see the wheel rotate. Might as well go in straight stitch, right? See how the wheel rotates along? It's gonna pull the fabric along as it goes, which is fantastic. So this was originally designed for making ladies gloves because you can pivot on a very tiny spot there. Has anybody heard of a vacuum that rhymes with Bryson? You know the brand I'm talking about. And they had a um, model come out that had a ball in it and it could pivot very easily. And that's very similar to what this foot does. It can pivot quite easily because it's only touching the feed dogs at that one little point. So it can, it can pivot quite easily. And that's why it was used for going around ladies gloves to be able to do the little curves around the fingers and in the between the fingers too, that's quite a little pivot that has to be done there. And I don't know about you, but when I'm quilting and using a walking foot, I hate having to do a curve with the walking foot because I have to pivot, pivot, pivot my foot and my work 27 million times. And that's not fun. So check out what happens when you sew with this foot. All right, I've set this up for just straight stitch of about 2.5 and I have to move the needle a little bit closer to the foot. So I'm just gonna move it closer to the foot. All right. And I'm gonna let it just sew straight. Wow. Easy peasy. I've got nice even stitches. Isn't that great? Um, so the feed dogs are keeping the stitches even. So it's not like free motion where I have to keep the stitches even or I have to use a Bernina stitch regulator regulator to keep the stitches even. The feed dogs are doing the work for me, even if I do some curves. Oh, I got stuck. Nobody's perfect. Okay, so that move would have been fairly okay with a walking foot 
And then it would have been kind of tricky with a walking foot. We would have had to lift the presser foot several times to pivot around that. So this allows for gentle curves. Not only that, I can kind of echo along that by eyeballing the edge of my foot along the previously sewn line. So I'm just gonna eyeball that edge of the foot along that stitch line. I can echo. I might get a little tight, let's see. I got distracted. have to pivot a little bit here. Whee! Okay, that was way easier than doing it with my walking foot. That would have been very hard to accomplish those curves. And I did go off course a little bit because I'm really excited to be here with you guys, but you get the idea of echoing. So you can use this foot that was originally designed for moving leather and one of you pointed out that she uses it on vinyl. Oh yeah, Kathy does. She uses it on vinyl because it doesn't stick so much to the base, right? And to the foot, Kathy, it drags it through really nicely. Good point, Kathy, thanks. So this is a really great one if you wanna do free motion quilting, but you want assistance. Maybe you have a machine that doesn't allow for a Bernina stitch regulator and you'd still love to do things that are curvy you can do that here. You can do pointy things too. Let me show you. You could do a leaf if you wanted. You could do all kinds of things. I have the option I can pivot perfectly. And make a cute leaf. And then I could go back and echo it. I could come back. There we go. Okay. I don't think I could have done that with my walking foot to make such a nice smooth leaf like that. Um, keeping the curve and the stitches all even. This foot does a really good job of that. And when it really shines for me, I'd love to know when you like to use it, but when it really shines for me is when I have to do a panel. So if I were to quilt this panel with a walking foot, I'd have to pivot, pivot, pivot around the curve. So that would be irritating. Um, if I did this with my BSR, maybe I'm not great at BSR yet. Maybe I need more practice. So what I'm gonna do is use this foot to help me use it as a long, I've got the benefits that it's gonna Keep my stitches even, it's pivoting so I can make curves, and I'll show you how great that is. Um, yep, Helen, it's almost used as a free motion foot. We call this method faux free motion because it's not free motion. The feed dogs, the feed dogs are still up and engaged, um, but I'm getting the benefits there or the look of free motion. So I'm going to start here by this flower. Right. And you would pull up your thread like normal, but we're just doing a demo. And I'm just gonna gauge, oh, I'm thinking about two millimeters away from the edge. And that's all the thinking I have to do. I'm gonna pivot a little bit here because I got distracted. See how not scary this is? It's not the Bernina stitch regulator, which I adore the Bernina stitch regulator. But if you're not ready for that, this is simple. Oh, I went off road, that's okay. You gotta see what's on the other side of the road every now and then. It looks rustic. That's what my friend Cheryl would say. It's rustic. That's the new classy is rustic. <laughs> it because I forgot what I was doing. So now I can make a really tight turn. It's rustic. Don't worry. Actually, I love it. 
I need to go offline more often. It's so freeing to not stay on the lines. Why didn't I think of that sooner? So cool. See how easy that is? Yeah, a couple of people are saying they're having problem with the internet. It's streaming pretty good here, guys, but there is some weather around in Southern Ontario. We had a power outage last night, right? Yeah, it was last night. Just a brief one. No need to go that fast. Here you go. So you get the idea how quickly you can sew something irregular like that that normally might be difficult with either the BSR or the walking foot. Neither one might be perfect for you in this situation, but maybe the 55 roller foot would be a great idea. Yeah, Lorenta, I use this foot all the time. Like, um, uh, there was another lady that was saying she uses it in the on vinyl. Kathy, she uses it on vinyl. I use it on vinyl and leather and cork if it's too hard to get those uh, tricky materials to go through. Um, and leather especially, if you want to do a circle like a keychain, this is great because you're only gripping the feed dogs at that one little point at the bottom of the foot, right? This is the only place engaged with the feed dog. So that's what's allowing me to be able to pivot. I hope that helps you to understand this foot a little bit better. The other thing you can do with this foot is you can make jumbo piping or attach jumbo piping or do repairs to items that are really tricky. Like once I had to do a repair to a comforter, like a down comforter, and it had this unusually thick um, piping at the edge of it, and I couldn't get my zipper foot close enough to the piping to do the repair. So what I did was instead, um, let's just pretend it's on the other side. Sorry if I'm in the way. So what I did was I could use this foot and now I could get close enough to be able to repair because the stern piping was in the way. But now I could get my needle close enough to secure the fabric beside the piping. And this is the same way you would make jumbo piping. You could encase something this large in fabric and then you could attach it to the jacket that you're making or the fancy pillow or the quilt edge or whatever else strikes your fancy because you're so creative. So this, um, although it's named the uh, uh, leather roller foot, it's really kind of a misnomer because that's the last thing I use it for. It's great on pleather and vinyl too, right? Like um, that marine vinyl that people are using a lot in bags, it works really, really well on that as well. So I hope this gives you a little bit of inspiration for this coming week and um, the sale that our buy two presser feet get one free. Take your time to decide which feet you need because this sale goes on until I think it's July 5th. So you have time to decide, do your research. I'll get together a whole bunch of um, resources and put them on our Bernina Canada Pinterest page. I really encourage you to look for more information on these feet in the Bernina Big Book of Feet. And we're going to have another contest for this copy of Big Book of Feet. I found one more. I was finally back in the office. Woo! So we're going to raffle or, you know, give away this copy tomorrow. Look for the contest tomorrow. And yeah, if you get a chance, learn more about the courting feet in Crafting Fun. There's the bowl information. And of course, the binding technique I talked about is here in um, the binding technique. But, and I will get in the book, and I will get a whole bunch more information, tutorials, videos, and inspiration for these feet and put them in a Pinterest page. Look for that tomorrow as well. I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation and look forward to next week's presentation same time different place 
<laughs> no, we'll still be here in the basement, I think. Uh, see you next Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Have a great week.